like to share with you uh, some of what uh, has been discovered regarding the Gospels so that we can understand how to approach the Gospels and how to uh, understand why the Gospels retain both sayings of Jesus which would indicate his limitations and also sayings which would indicate that he is somehow divine. Let me then go to my slides. As the Gospels now appear in, in the Bible, this is the order, starting from uh, left, your left to right, Matthew first, Mark, Luke, and, and then John. However, uh, scholars generally today believe that Mark was the first of the four Gospels to be written. And hence, this would be roughly the order, Mark first, Matthew and Luke somewhere in between, and finally, John. One of the scholars uh, who has uh, uh, contributed to this conclusion, or rather has accepted the conclusion, and is undoubtedly uh, a conservative scholar, let me check with uh, James. Is uh, Richard Balcom a conservative scholar? <laughs> somewhere there. Is F.F. Uh, Bruce a conservative scholar? Oh, by the way. Uh, Since he is a conservative scholar, I'd like to present to you one New of my Testament history by yeah. Brooks. Thank you very much. You're welcome. One of my textbooks. <laughs> now, both Richard Balcom and F.F. F. Bruce hold to the idea that Mark was first and John last. Now, this is a very important conclusion, and we'll see where it heads. The dating I've given here for Mark's Gospel is 65 to 75, and that corresponds to the specific dating that has been given by Richard Balcom. Well, I said specific, but obviously there's a range because there is a certain amount of subjectivity involved in trying to determine the precise dates. According to F.F. F. Bruce, a few years earlier than this, because he said the, the middle uh, of, the, uh, sixth, uh, of the, the middle 60s, uh, and so it could be somewhere in close to that, uh, but not to the 75 uh, number. John's Gospel in the last decade of the first century. So anywhere from 90 to 100, and uh, this seems to be what F.F. F. Bruce says uh, uh, repeatedly, that John wrote towards the close of the first century. Now what else do these scholars tell us? So Matthew and Luke are somewhere in, in between, but it is important to notice also that the scholars believe that Mark was a source used by Matthew and Luke in the composition of their own Gospels. Now that's natural. If somebody has written a Gospel, you're going to write another one. Why start from scratch? You use the existing document and you, you write it according to the way you know the facts to be or the, to bring out the message you would like to bring out. So Matthew and Luke did this. But as noted by F.F. F. Bruce, Matthew and Luke sometimes made improvements to Mark's Gospel. Now, he didn't spell out what all of the improvements are, but the improvements are, I believe, very important, and we should take uh, cognizance of, of what they are. For example, there are improvements which uh, show that in, in Mark's Gospel, somebody addressed Jesus as rabbi, such as in Mark chapter 9, verse 5, but then in Matthew's Gospel, in the same incident, you can compare them side by side. You go from Mark to Matthew, the same incident, the person uh, referred to Jesus as Lord. So in, in Mark 9, 5, Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. In Matthew 17, 4, Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. So in the one gospel, he's called Rabbi, the earlier one. In the later gospel, he's called Lord. So there is a, a significant improvement here from a Christian point of view. Uh, second, there are improvements in which... Uh, uh, we find in the later gospel that Jesus describes himself as Lord. For example, in Mark chapter 13, verse 35, therefore keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come. In, uh, compare that with Matthew chapter 24, verse 42. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. When I mentioned this in Seattle a, a few years ago, uh, James took issue uh, regarding this. Actually, I hadn't mentioned it in Seattle. I mentioned it elsewhere, then James took issue with it during our Seattle debate. And uh, following that, I wrote a rejoinder uh, reaffirming that th this difference actually does exist. Uh, third, uh, there are improvements in which the later gospel 
it calls Jesus the Son of God. For example, Mark chapter 8, verse 29, Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. But compare that with Mark, Matthew chapter 16, verse 16, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, Son of the living God. So the later gospel has inserted here, Son of the living God, in Peter's speech, as it is admitted by many scholars who have worked on this. Four, there are improvements in which the later gospel certain, suddenly calls God Father. Uh, or has Jesus uh, call God uh, Father? Uh, Mark chapter 3, verse 31, whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Matthew chapter 12, verse 46, improves that by saying that Jesus said, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So it was God in the earlier gospel, was Father in the, second, in the later gospel. Five, there are improvements uh, so as to have people pray to Jesus. Uh, for example, uh, when a storm broke out, Jesus was asleep in the stern, and the disciples came up to Jesus and, and awoke him, according to Mark's gospel, Mark chapter 4, verse 38, and they said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? What did they call Jesus? Teacher. teacher. Again, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? In Matthew chapter 8, verse 25, same incident, uh, they approached Jesus and they said, uh, Lord, save us. We are perishing. What did they call him this time? Lord. It's the same incident, just the later gospel. The situation has been changed, or the, the, the wording has been changed. Then there are improvements to reduce Jesus' emphasis on one God. In Mark chapter 12, verse 29, uh, Jesus was uh, asked, what is the first and the greatest commandment? And this is what he said. The first is, hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. So he repeated basically what is known as the Shema Israel, which pious Jews will repeat twice a day, reminding themselves that there is only one God, Yahweh, as uh, to use the name that uh, uh, James already used here tonight, and, or Jehovah, to, to use uh, another spelling of the same name. Whether that is right or not, that's a different question, but it's popular. Some say Jehovah, some say Yahweh. According to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, a hero Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. The name there that is translated as the Lord is Yahweh or Jehovah. So it really sh it sounds in the New Jerusalem Bible, hero Israel, Yahweh, your Lord, is one Yahweh. Jehovah, your Lord, is one Jehovah. In fact, in Deuteronomy, it also says, besides him, there is no other. Jesus is repeating the same as the first commandment in Mark's gospel. But then the same story is told in Matthew's gospel. What has happened to the first commandment is just not mentioned. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 and 38, uh, Jesus just simply uh, said the part about loving your Lord with all your heart and, and, and all your soul and with all your mind. And he said, this is the greatest and the first commandment. But that's not true. That is not the, uh, that is not the first commandment. The first commandment is, as it was mentioned in Mark, the earlier uh, of these two gospels. Uh, finally, or, or last but one, there are uh, improvements to reduce the distinction which Jesus made between himself and God. For example, in Mark 10, 18, a man had come up to Jesus and called him good teacher. And Jesus then replied, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. But in Matthew 19, 17, the same incident is there. And the man approached Jesus and, called him, and asked him, uh, what must... I, what good deed must I do? I have to start over. See, in Mark's gospel, the man comes up to Jesus and says, good teacher. But in Matthew's gospel, the man comes up to Jesus and says, what uh, uh, teacher, what good <clears throat> Three deed? minutes. So, uh, whereas in Mark's gospel, he calls Jesus good, so then Jesus replies, why do you call me good? In Ma Matthew's gospel, he only asks about what is good, and so Jesus says, why do you ask me about what is good? So Jesus does not repudiate the title in Matthew's gospel. According to James Dunn, uh, uh, Matthew here has modified uh, not only the response, but to order to, in order to get the modified response, he also modified the man's question. Finally, there are improvements to, to cover the human limitations of Jesus. Uh, for example, in, Matthew, in Mark's Gospel, chapter 11, verses 12 to 14, uh, Jesus approached a fig tree thinking that he would find uh, fruit on it, but uh, when he did not find any fruit on it, 
he cursed the fig tree. Why didn't he find any fruit on it? Mark is very clear. Because it was not the season for figs. But then in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21, verse 18, uh, the situation is changed. Uh, Jesus is hungry. He sees the fig tree. He went to it. He found nothing to it but leaves. And he said to it, may no fruit ever come from you again. The difference is that Matthew here has removed the mention that it was not the season for figs. This allows Christians to meditate on, this, on Matthew's statement and, and make that into a parable about good and bad and what happens to those who do not fulfill their functions. They get destroyed just like this fig tree because they do not do what they're supposed to do. But as Mark's gospel makes it plain, the reason there, was no, there, were, there were no figs is because it was not the season for figs and therefore it appears that Jesus here has made a mistake and which is natural for a human being. Muslims uh, would not have uh, any difficulty accepting that such an error could occur. Finally, in the minute that I have uh, remaining, when we go to John's Gospel, we see that in John's Gospel, the situation has improved even further. Now, we go apart from these three Gospels to, uh, to John's Gospel, and we notice that now Jesus it, suddenly, the whole thing is rewritten. So whereas in fact in Mark's Gospel you will find, for example, that Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, indicating that he has a will different from that of the Father, but nevertheless he submits his will. In John's Gospel, uh, we're told that Jesus wouldn't pray like that. In John 13, when Jesus enters Jerusalem, or when he approaches Jerusalem, he says, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this very reason that I came to this hour. So this is a very different presentation in John's Gospel. John doesn't have the Garden of Gethsemane prayer in which Jesus says, Save me from this hour. In John, Jesus wouldn't pray like that. In the other Gospels, Judas Iscariot is necessary for uh, surrendering Jesus to the authorities. But in John's Gospel, John it, it has Jesus handing himself over to the authorities. They do not dare arrest him, just his voice blows them over. Right from the very beginning in the Gospel according to John, uh, John the Baptist uh, declares that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So we have here a, a developing Christology over time. Why did the early uh, Christians think that uh, Jesus is, is time. God? It's because largely uh, John's Gospel and this development over time. Thank you very much.